and to everyone, uh, even those of us joining remotely, uh, let us all practice good digital citizenship and mute your microphone when you're not speaking. And uh, remember to unmute it if you're going to speak, particularly board members or during public comment if you're uh, joining us remotely. And in addition, uh, if you're joining remotely and you have your camera on, I hope that's inadvertent and uh, you probably don't want that camera on if you're joining us remotely. So, uh, having called it to order, before we go any farther, I will give what in my estimation is the longest pre-meeting explanation I can remember. I just want to share with you what tonight is, what tomorrow night is that we hope, what the distinction is, and uh, maybe try and add a little clarity to some uh, uh, uncertainty or some questions we've gotten relative to tonight, last meeting, next meeting, etc. So uh, there's been a little uh, inaccuracies floated around about the actions the board took at the previous meeting having been done in a closed meeting or sort of behind closed doors, etc. That is completely not true. Um, it was a special meeting only in the regard that typically that meeting in May is only to address open enrollment applications. And we have a very, very limited agenda. That enrollment deadline got kicked down the road a little bit such that we didn't have that on the agenda. Consequently, administration brought the elementary boundary issue or, or circumstance to us wanting um, to move forward with that process sooner than later. Um, I think most of you would understand, or let me back up a step. There's been another uh, circle of thought to be kind that this was done hastily or it was done without uh, lots of research and input and regard for how it impacts people. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth. The administrators have been working on this since last fall and through a series of meetings and gaining knowledge about how this particular situation impacts everybody. And please remember that while we certainly respect and expect your advocacy for your kids, right? They're the only ones that are important to you. Our job is to take care of 3,500 kids. And Maybe the other thing that's not abundantly clear is that this is a complex issue that has a bit of a domino effect. If we change a piece, it has a ripple effect, an echo or whatever we want to call it, in other areas of the district, other grade levels, other buildings, etc. So we realized after the May meeting that folks need and want to weigh in on that issue. I felt badly after the May meeting that it unfolded the way it did, that we did not have folks able to address us with that. So it certainly was shared that we want you to be able to do that. And we wanted tonight to, it was the next board meeting, of course. So that was the logical place to have folks address us. As it became clear that folks have questions, they want information, it was clear that a standard board meeting and the protocols that we have to follow was not going to allow that type of interaction and dialogue. Um, we will have public comment in a few minutes. And let me be clear, I will preclude or prevent no one from talking about this particular issue. It's, it's remotely on the agenda, and we're going to give you latitude there. If you want to talk about this particular thing, fine. Please don't digress into something completely irrelevant to what, what's on the, tonight's agenda or that related issue. It's, in, in our policy, it's set up that you can address us for three minutes. You address the board only, and we are non-responsive. Uh, we can't answer your questions other than maybe a very simple yes or no, if it was a you know very simple uh, issue that way. But, and then you're only allowed to speak once, and we're technically supposed to limit that to 15 minutes. Now, 
We have the latitude to waive that and go beyond 15 minutes. We certainly have in some cases, but we probably can't interact and engage you in a conversation or answer your questions to the level that you want and that we need to. So I guess it's probably my idea. I came up with it, talked about it with Rich a week or so ago. I said, you know, we need to have a better forum for people to both hear and understand what's gone on to get us to this point and then to address us share your concerns and let me be clear too that we are willing to work on this and create a better outcome than maybe you're assuming has been cast so far that's probably not on tonight's task as far as action to undo what we've done or whatever however between tonight your comments, tomorrow night's interaction and learning, you know, your concerns, et cetera. If we discover a solution that can move us, you know, in a better path and assuage some concerns and be less abrupt and, you know, I, I don't know exactly what's possible, but we scheduled that listening session between tonight's meeting and another piece of misinformation was that, well, we don't meet again until July, so that's too late and you won't be able to act on it. That's not true. We meet two weeks from tonight. Um, and presumably, if we discover a better solution or a compromise or a, an amendment of sorts that can address some of these concerns, we could act on it at that meeting. It would still be before the end of June and then folks could, uh, have a chance to go from there. So I apologize for the length of that discussion, but I wanted you to be clear. Now, if you've signed up to comment tonight, feel free to do so. Um, I would remind you to please be respectful and courteous. Don't single out individuals. You have to address the board. Um, while we certainly expect, maybe even deserve your criticism, we don't deserve your disrespect. So please keep it civil, positive, et cetera. We will be responsive, not in that we answer your questions, but what you bring up tonight, if you can't come tomorrow night, will certainly be recorded um, and brought with us, if you will. And if you can join us tomorrow night and you wanna share the same message, feel free. Um, if you have questions that we could answer, um, and like I said, I'm assuming tomorrow night, um, it's not a regular board meeting. Um, I hope all of my board colleagues can join us. Uh, we're going to have an interactive format whereby the first portion of the meeting, I have charged our administrative folks to present, if you will, what has gotten us to this point. Sort of the current situation or last year's situation, why we feel like that's not sustainable for the long term the options that they looked at. And I think some folks have charged us with not looking at option A, B, C, you know, each has a particular solution that they think is, is amenable. And, and quite likely it can be, but our administrative folks have been exhaustive. And I want a chance to share that. I don't think a letter to you or a memo to you can be as comprehensive as that presentation. Hopefully the folks that are affected, the folks that are interested can join us tomorrow night and have a chance to hear all of that. You may remain unconvinced. I, I, that's okay, I guess. I can't, I can't tell you how to interpret any of that, but we wanna be able to share that in a fairly comprehensive format and then get you to respond. And hopefully we can, we can take your responses and meld them into a, you know, a solution that, that fixes as much of this as we can. So please, please understand we are not trying to evade this. We are, you know, compassionate, you know, across the board, the school board, the admin, the principals, the teachers, they, they care deeply about your kids, the kids, our kids, however we want to talk about them. So I better get moving or we will never get out of here. So I beg your apology there, but um, we will roll to the first item, and typically, if you haven't joined us before, that is a Pledge of Allegiance. I would invite you to join me in a salute to our flag and country.
I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I don't often have a problem being heard. If that's the case, please give me a little bit of a high sign or something, and I will try to project. I hope the mic is picking me up. I don't have my earbuds in, but I uh, hope that's picking up uh, what I'm saying for the folks that are remote, and, and I hope you can hear me uh, across this room, too. So thank you for that. Uh, action on the agenda, Mr. Donovan, are you aware of any changes? No changes to the agenda. I'll make a motion to approve the agenda as presented. Okay, motion and second, motion from Rick, seconded by Shelley to approve the agenda as you see it. Uh, all in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Thank you. The agenda is approved with the caveat that your public comments will be allowable relative to the elementary issue. So just don't, don't feel like we're trying to preclude that. So. Okay, and moving on to action on the minutes. Uh, those are included in your board packet. We did not approve them at the previous meeting. As I mentioned, that was an abbreviated agenda, so we have two sets of minutes uh, included. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes for the regular meeting held on May 11th, 2020, and the special meeting held on May 26th, 2020, as presented. Second. Thank you. Motion from Rick, seconded by Diamond, to approve both sets of minutes from our previous two meetings. Are there any questions on those minutes? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank, Thank you. you. Minutes are approved. Action on the vouchers is next. I make a motion to approve fund 10 vouchers totaling $87,129.56, building fund 49 vouchers totaling $103,976. Thank you. Motion from Diamond, seconded by Mike, to approve the vouchers. And just a little disclaimer, I think there are some folks joining us for the first time, and we we'll welcome you. We'd love to see you. Um, fund 10 is our general fund, if you will. Fund 49 is our building fund relative to the uh, referendum project. So those are the two different uh, approvals tonight. Um, any questions on the vouchers? Hearing none, all in favor of approving, signify by saying aye. 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 And opposed? Thank you, the vouchers are approved. Okay, we are up to public participation. And I, give, I gave all of the disclaimers that that probably needs. So we're gonna invite you, and I guess I'm gonna pull, I think you've signed, two or three different sheets here, and I'll beg your pardon if I get them out of order, but uh, we'll go in the order that they started with. If you wanna pass your spot, uh, given what I've told you about tomorrow night, that's perfectly fine. If you wanna keep your spot and make your comments, feel more than welcome to do that. Um, try to limit the redundancy. There are, uh, Six, nine, 13, there are 19 people signed up to comment. If someone makes the exact point that you were hoping to make, um, please uh, bear that in mind. We're gonna, we're gonna give you the latitude here beyond the 15 minutes if need be, but we don't wanna hijack the entire meeting. That's tomorrow night's goal, is to give you a chance to do that in a little bit more detail. So. Having said that, I think first on the list is Chris Blasick. I hope I got that right. Chris, are you, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Please um, come over to the podium here, and I believe there's a mic that will pick you up. And um, when you are ready, please. So I'm, I'm just going to leave it kind of short and sweet. I'll keep both my comments till tomorrow. But okay. I, I understand your comment when you say you have to watch and take care of 3,500 students, but the issue is not with 3,500 students, it's with a select number of four to eight year olds. And security and safety and being in the same environment for them is, allows them to learn a lot better. They don't have to worry about who they're gonna see next, where they're gonna go next, what bus they're gonna ride. So 
you're take these kids from one school that been there for three years and you move them to another one for one year, then you move them to another one for two years and move another one for two years. You know, it's a lot of hopping. I understand, you know, it's nice for to get a kid into a different environment. Sometimes that works out great, but other times it creates anxiety. I mean, me, myself, changing jobs, I get anxiety over it. I, you know, it's very uncomfortable. Kids are the same way, especially when they're this age. You know, everything they do, everything they learn is through osmosis, is repetition or intensity. So to just make a move, I think numbers are probably a little bit low. 10 to 15% of kids are going to move. I, I feel that's a little bit low. Uh, I mean, we're talking about a small group. Uh, I think it just it needs to be looked at. I mean, I understand the Boston situation. I understand, I understand the cost. I understand you guys have to run a budget. I understand that. But, you know, to do a slam, this is the way we're doing it from now on. And no matter how much input was put into it before, how much research was put into it before, a lot of the research also needs to have input from other people. I mean, the idea of having a community is to sit there and have input from everybody else. I mean, this Milton is a small community. We pay per capita, per thousand, we pay the same as Janesville does for taxes, $9 and like 28 cents. So, I mean, it's right along the same lines. Most of us that have been here, went to school here, graduated here. We moved back here. We stayed here, you know, for the school district. We take our kids to the school district for specific reasons. Granted, some of us probably want them to go to certain schools. I understand sometimes that's not available. But when you take them out of daycares, you take them out of providers before and after school providers, just because of their inside of a boundary, not only do you affect the student, but you also affect the small business. Understandably, people complained and said, we want something inside the school, which is, that's understandable too, give them an option. But to take and say, well, we have a perfect option for you, use the YMCA inside the school, affects the individual daycares. The daycare that all of a sudden, you know, has nine kids, you know, eight kids, but they go to random schools because they got transportation in between. They can get on the bus, they can transfer, they can do this, they can do that. Now all of a sudden loses eight of their kids. Now their only kids that they can take care of is one, two, three-year-olds and the area that they're in. Well, when you have two or three daycares in a specific area, you know, you weed things out. I mean, I, I just feel it needs more openness and also allow people to say what they're thinking. I mean, there's obviously there's no perfect solution. Obviously there's something that needs to be done, but can it be done a little bit better? I mean, I mean, I think it's there. I mean, I'm not discounting what any, any work anybody's done. I think it's good work, but I think a little bit more openness and a little bit more listening, it can come to a better agreement, even if it's a, even if it's a step program. I mean, obviously things need to happen, fully understandable, but you know, that slam all of a sudden everybody gets a thing in the mail and the email saying hey this is your new boundary this is where you're going to school and uh, life as you know it for your four-year-old five-year-old six-year-old is now changing and i mean you have absolutely no warning i, I just it's on yeah it's 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 something that has been an issue in the past and unfortunately uh i don't think you guys want it to be the issue but it kind of reared its little ugly head. I am good. I appreciate you guys listening. I'll, I'll have more tomorrow, just a couple ideas. But thank I think she's muted. The issue lies more with the transportation piece. My son turns eight years old in just a few short months, and he's been going to a child care provider since he was three months old. That child care provider is about one mile from my house. My house is within the consolidated area, which is about, my house is about four minutes to consolidate. My child care provider's is five. So now you are asking 
me to have to find a new child care provider because now you're not going to boss outside because my child care provider is technically within the West District. So I was very moved when you talked about the ripple effect. So now the ripple effect for me as a single working mother is you are forcing me to try to find a new child care provider and giving me, hey, here's the option that you can use the school. What about when there's no school days? What about the summer? What about spring break? I am blessed to have a child care provider that has given my son a family. And not only a family within her family, but a family within the students and the other children that he has gone to for almost eight years now. So that ripple effect is not only an emotional effect. And seriously, this is a sucker punch to a single mama that you can, I, I cannot deal with anymore right now. The homeschooling about killed me. I mean, come on. Seriously, you are asking way too much of us to now to try to find this. This is too much. I mean, I understand the redistricting, but we need to have some latitude and we need to have some courtesy for the parents. I mean, single parents and trying to find childcare, that is a nightmare. This is too much. So I ask for some reconsideration in the transportation piece. The districting piece is that's not my beef, but I certainly am well supportive of my fellow classmates and their, and their families because my son does not want to lose his friends that he has developed over all those years. But I sincerely ask for some reconsideration on that subject. Okay, thank you. Uh, Heidi Mandel. of homeschooling, civil unrest. Yes, I'm an advocate for my children, but also advocate for what is right. So if you took the emails that I sent you, partially I do apologize for that. I do believe in love and kindness. Yes, this is a difficult time for everybody. Transportation is very important for everybody. School districts, very important. Boundaries, very important. I get it, it's not an easy job. But as I shared with some of you, the process that Oregon High School did, they made it work. They worked with the community and everybody was happy. These new boundaries push us over to West. It's farther away from consolidated. Our children will have a longer bus ride. And I don't know what you're doing with bus transfers for our individuals. I will save most of my comments for tomorrow, but I think a lot of us feel the same, that if we knew these changes were happening, Maybe we wouldn't support the school district. Maybe we wouldn't support the school board and maybe we wouldn't have voted for the referendum. I thank you for some of you emailing me back saying that this could have been done different. I thank you for holding yourselves accountable for that. I hope that we all can work together and come up with a better compromise. And if you're looking for people to act as liaisons, you've got my email. I'm willing to do whatever I can to make this situation better. And I look forward to discussing this further tomorrow with you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Stephanie Robbian. Robbian. I'll start with just expressing my disappointment and how this has come about to begin with. Um, I always have valued the school district being open with the community. I've always valued this community um, in how we work together. Um, we're a small community. I, I know 90% of the people in this room. Uh, I feel like if this would have been brought to our attention last fall, now that I hear that that's when it first came about, uh, there could have been some productive discussion, some productive communication about this, maybe brought some issues to light that were overlooked, such as the child care situation. Um, for my personal situation, we moved out of the Harmony area um, as of October, and I was reassured by two administrators within the school district that my children would be able to remain at Harmony. Well, now that's changing. 
as a result of these changes, if there are no exemptions allowed, my child will have to skip 4K next year because we won't have childcare for her within um, the West area. Because as you may know, there's a huge shortage of childcare right now. Uh, we have a long standing childcare provider um, that's like family to us, that's within the Harmony area. Um, if my child's not able to get bused from there to West or otherwise attend Harmony, we're not able to attend 4K. That's gonna be really disappointing for her since she's seen her older brother and sister go to school for years now and she's already talked about riding the bus. She's purchased her backpack, her lunchbox, she's ready to go. Um, my seven-year-old, when I told her that she may have to switch schools, she's already started developing anxiety over that. Um, so aside from now, having to leave their school the last three months, deal with homeschooling, um, a whole new environment, they can't leave their house, things have changed. Now to tell them that at the end of the summer they might have to change schools is is causing a lot of anxiety and a lot of heartbreak. So I will address this further tomorrow. My name is Leah Zasko. I am owner of Zasti Family Child Care, and I have been in business in Milton since 2005. I'm a five-star rated in-home provider. I care for eight kids plus school-agers. Um, I'm currently uh, taking care of essential worker children, um, and I've been blessed uh, to be able to have my kids. Um, some of the concerns that this transportation issue is arising is that I care for infants. Infant care in Milton is non-existent. I have a two-year wait list in order to get into my program, and I know that's the same for the other pro providers in Milton. Um, my parents plan around when I have an opening in order to get into my program. So my infants that are in my program who now have a five-year-old who's supposed to start 4K or 5K in East, because I'm at West, now this parent, in order to secure the infant spot, has two drop-offs, two pickups, two payments. One payment's gonna be higher because it's gonna be a center. They lose their sibling discount. Again, another financial hit. That other center does not provide food. The list just goes on and on about the struggles that you're gonna ask for with this situation. That five-year-old, for those days off school, for the summer care, in order to be back in with a one-stop situation, am I, as a business owner, supposed to hold a full-year spot for this without income? I can't afford that as a business owner. And I can tell you this COVID-19 situation for other Some of these providers are not full. And when you're telling them that they now have to lose some of those kids and they can't refill these spots or have to wait months for all of this to shift around to fill those spots, we have already gone three months without income. And now you're gonna tell them they have to go another couple months until they can get those spots filled. You will have child cares closed, I guarantee you. You will lose child care options in Wisconsin already has a 54% desert, which means there is one spot open for every three children that need it. And you're going to have providers that will be closing their doors. They cannot handle any more financial hardship that we've already been dealing with. And you're asking us to lose kids because of split incomes or the split situations. I have a family that's in East. They're willing to switch to West in order to keep me as a provider. You need to have some options open for these parents to be able to keep the relationships that they have with us. These are three, four, five, I've had kids for 10 years. If you were to tell me that I'm now losing these kids to a center, when these kids need this, the uh, carpeted areas, the couch, they need a nap in the morning in order to be successful at school all day. They cannot do a wraparound care from seven in the morning till five at night in a uh, hard surface. My kids with ADD that need the one-on-one -on -one direction, you can't keep them in a, a 30 kid environment 
all day and think that's going to be successful for these parents because now you're making them switch to public daycare. And the days off school, you can't expect me to hold these spots in order to get some success for, back into these kids' lives. I have You talk about the special needs and how all of these different facilities are able to help the special needs that now have to switch schools. Well, now you're asking these special needs kids to now not have family providers because West doesn't have a public daycare on that side. We have small family providers. East has large, they have no family providers. You're talking about a lot of kids switching to either find a spot that's not existent in a family child care provider or endure being in a center and a large group situation that they just can't be successful in. So I really think, and to put the financial burden on a person that can only have eight children for us to pay for the busing option in order for this transfer bus, we can't afford to be paying when we only have income from eight kids. And to put that onto a parent, an infant cost, your, it's a $200 bill, another child full-time, another $200 bill. When you're already paying $400 a week, that's a mortgage. And I get that. I, as a business owner, I need that in order to pay my mortgage, in order to make that my career. And I'm very successful in my career, and I'm available for my kids long-term, and I expect to be here for those kids long-term. But this is a nightmare, and this isn't going to work for the business side of it or for the family side of it when it comes to those kids that are in the daycare. So I ask that you look at the daycares as being a separate entity, that we, it is not, you use, use like some other formula when it comes to where they're currently and look at it and it is an individual or let them go to West if they have babies. I don't know, but more discussion needs to happen. So thank you. Thank you for, I'm sure this is a struggle, obviously it has been. Um, my concern is with the transportation for the daycare centers. Um, both my husband and I, we commute. Um, I work in Madison, he works in Whitewater. So we're really reliant on small wonders to um, get our kids on the bus, go to East. Um, and now it seems that the daycare centers are not going to be able to really have the bus system. And I don't know if I'm misinformed on that, but I really, I know that the daycare and childcare in general for a lot of parents is um, a big concern it's really hard to find someone that you trust to watch your kids. Um, and just even the kids too, for them to make friends and then just have such a change. Um, I have several, several friends that go to small wonders that they, um, they were told by different schools in the beginning of the year prior to them moving that they would still be able to go to their same school. And they, pro they moved in locations now that they're told that they can't go to the school that they were already told. And the um, lack of empathy and compassion that they've gotten responses from uh, an administration is a little disheartening. And I know that they're planning on going to the, um, listen, um, session tomorrow, but I would hope that based on your presentation that hopefully it will answer a lot of questions. Um, I am a person that really likes to try and understand why changes are made. So right now I just feel really in the dark and I, I know that a lot of people kind of feel a little in the dark and I, this is my first school board meeting. I just had a kindergartner. Um, so this, this whole process is new for me, so I'm I'm hoping that this is not the precedent that you guys have, that you are open and honest. I really appreciated your dialogue in the beginning. It was a great explanation for me being a first-time person uh, coming here. So 
Um, I look forward to the information that you guys are going to be providing tomorrow. And I do hope that you reconsider about daycare centers and transportation. Um, oh, my husband, uh, one other thing too was, I don't know how the transportation contracts work and stuff, but we live a mile and a half away from school, but we have to pay uh, 200, whatever the price is. We have to pay for our elementary kids to ride the bus from Small Wonders, and it's less than a minute that we have to pay. So we were just kind of inquiring, you know, how that all operates and if, you know, you're not going to have an elementary child, you're not going to have a kindergartner or first grader walk in a mile and a half to school. So for parents that have to commute, if there's any, like, ways to help financially with that, too, I don't know. So thank you. Um, thank you. I really appreciate you taking the time to listen and to open up discussion to this um, attendance area situation. Um, I kind of want to focus mostly on what's on the agenda for planning for next year's school year. Um, in regard to this attendance area issue. So I listened to that special meeting on YouTube. I watched the whole thing. Um, you talked a lot about going, you know, planning and kind of what the possible options are with the hybrid going, social distancing, and then went to the voting on, on the attendance areas. I didn't hear much discussion on how the pandemic that we are still going through changes anything that was discussed in regard to the attendance areas that were created, how school ended, whether this is the best time to do this, even if it financially makes sense, a lot of things had to change this year. A lot of redirection needed to be taken. A lot of things that had been put forward needed to be pulled back. This is one of those things. This, we have, kids were abruptly taken from school and my son, and I know you said, for, you know, 3,500 kids, but I really do care about all, all kids. My son goes to Consolidated. He's going to be in third grade. It kills me to think that he abruptly left his second grade year and will never return. And Consolidated is a little bit of a special school. And I see didn't, the principal for Consolidated and Harmony didn't seem to be in the planning part that I heard on the, um, the previous meeting, but... That's a school that has they're the, the same kids, one year to the next. It's, it's a lot to ask of my son and his classmates and all the other kids that have to change. The anxiety issues, I mean, we work at, I work on, I'm an active community member. I work at, on the Milton Youth Coalition and a huge topic is the huge rise in anxiety we have in the kids that go to our schools. Why add to that this year? I mean, it, it's already gonna be high. They're gonna walk into a new school not knowing anybody. Teachers may have masks and shields and everyone's separate. How do they build relationships in their new environments? I, I think um, I heard somebody mention the Oregon School District. I read through there. I think that really should take a look at how they did this. It, it may need to happen, but it may, it sounds like it does need to happen, but there could be a more stepwise approach to it, especially in the context of this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, my daughter is another one that goes to consolidated. It, this summer, I've become a single parent. So oh, I've had to leave from home, and I know I've emailed Mr. Dobbin a few times. Um, so between the pandemic, children having to move for various reasons, um, now being a single mother, I utilized um, the wraparound care at Consolidated last year. With the ability to pay in advance, you know, we were able to bring that down to $3.60 an hour. If I have to switch to the YMCA, that's $5 an hour doesn't sound like a lot, but if you multiply it out, it's $672 for the school year. I ask, where does that money come from? 
what happens to these kids that have been friends, you know, this previous year with kids. And now they're being ripped away. You know, I do want to attend tomorrow night as well. But these are things that you guys need to consider. Um, the financial impact for the parents. The emotional impact for the kids. You know, as many of them have said, they don't understand what's going on. You know, they've lost, they've lost their friends for the summer. they lost the end of the school year. Um, and now it sounds like I'm going to have to go home one of these nights and tell my kids that. Now she's going to a different school next year. How do you explain that to them? And so I want you guys between now and then to really think about that. And hopefully we can come up with some kind of compromise as to how to make this work for everybody. I think you're next. I have notes. Oh, well, can I go in and go? Yes. That, way, that works out for me. All right. Again, I want to thank the board for listening to us today. Today, I am asking the board to pause or reconsider the policy approval of the admin rule that would change the attendance area for 2020-2021 um, school year. And instead, take the next year to gather community feedback, plan for virtual learning disruptions, provide solutions rather than quick fixes, which I understand you said this isn't a quick fix, but it seems that way. This is the first we've heard of it. So they may have been working on it for a half a year, but everyone here, I think, has just heard about it. Um, and seek best practices for attendance area models from other school districts such as Oregon, which we've heard about, who recently started a phased process to address the same issues. Typical uh, schools our size have been taking two years to actually do this, not just a half a year and then roll right into it. So I'm asking the board to reconsider the administrative rule, which was set in 2017, I believe. And now we're just implementing it now. And I thank you for your time. Uh, first, I wanted to thank you for your time. Um, and I do just want to start by saying I am not here for my child. I am here for all of the children that's going to be happening. Um, I have a son that goes to Harmony. He is in wraparound care. I want we were told last year that the busing system would not bus us to our daycare, which is near consolidated, after I was told that I could pay for a seat and that still happened. That did not happen. I put my son on a wait list at Wraparound Care at Harmony in January when he was in 4K. I got a call one week before school started for kindergarten saying he was accepted only into the before school. The entire kindergarten year, he was never there was never an opening in the after school care program at Harmony. So I don't know how we're all expected to find child care. We are, there's limited opportunities in there and the wait lists are pretty significant. I was on January till August and still a year and a half later, my son never got into after school care. As a working parent, I don't know how, how to fix that. Um, and I feel the administration has been very dismissive of our concerns related to daycare and telling us parents to figure it out. Had maybe I been involved a year ago in all of this conversation, maybe I would have started looking at daycares right now. But to know that it is now June and potentially school starting in a few months, it is extremely unrealistic that these children that are going to be moved are going to be able to find new child care. As a former CPS worker, the thought of sending my children somewhere where I did not know them 
is absolutely terrifying. My daycare is here right now. My children have been going there for almost seven years. She's my family and we're disrupting my family. Half of the people, not half of the, there's several people in here that are in our daycare and she's not only gonna lose all those kids, she's losing her business and her livelihood. And I'm frustrated with that as well. I'm also frustrated with the fact that the response to this has been children are resilient. They'll get over this. As someone that works in mental health, some children are resilient, but the consequences of this long term, are, they're going to impact them. As several people have already said, this pandemic and how things have ended, several children are already struggling with things they never have before. The timing of this seems poor, and I would request that you reconsider. Thank you. Okay, I can breathe for a moment. Um, I, my name is Courtney Schlegel. Uh, my kids actually attend Milton School District through open enrollment. Um, we chose that for a few reasons. I'm a graduate of Milton High School. Um, I believe that Milton School District is a good school district. I believe that they're, the staff are capable of caring for my kids the way that they need to be cared for, that they're safe, um, and that they're going to provide them a good education. In addition to that, my in-home child care provider that my kids have been with since they were nine weeks old, each of them, um, lives in the Milton School District. So in addition to just believing that Milton was the right place for my kids, I was lucky enough to have a child care provider that uh, is wonderful um, and my kids love and they are safe there um, in the Milton School District. So my daughter is moving into the second grade. And Mrs. Schwengels has worked very hard with Annabelle. If anybody's ever met her, you know that she's a very bright and unique individual. And she will struggle, I promise you. And I'm sorry for the support staff that may have to deal <laughs> with that. And I'm sure I'll spend lots of time on the phone. Um, my son will be okay. So some kids will be okay. Some kids probably will struggle. Um, and I think that your staff and the support staff just speaking as someone who I've worked in child and adolescent mental health for 13, 14 years. <laughs> so as someone speaking from not just a parent, you know, who believes in safety and security, um, but also a mental health provider, like I think that you're going to have to prepare your staff and your support staff if this is all going to go through because you're going to have it's going to be trouble. We, these kids have been removed from school unexpectedly. I, March 13th, Friday, March 13th, my daughter came out with the biggest backpack I've ever seen in my entire life filled with library books. And I said, why is your bag so big? And she said, in case I don't get to go back to school. That was the first I had ever even thought that they wouldn't even return to school that Monday. And they didn't return to school that Monday. I still have that pile of library books in my home right now. So I just think that like, we need to, if this, again, I'm going to echo poor timing. This is poor timing, <laughs> you know, that these kids have been taken unexpectedly. They didn't say bye to anybody and walked out of school that Friday and never went back. And now you're going to tell me that maybe my daughter's not going to go see Mrs. Schwingles in the fall, like the, or the, 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 front desk people that she hugs when she has a dentist appointment or an eye appointment because she's got the cutest little glasses not to break. But like those are people that we trust. And like think about the way that like they left school. And then let's think about the fall. These kids need to be able to feel safe, secure, like they know somebody. And that's not going to happen. Think about the academic losses that we had last the end of the school year and how them just figuring out their new space and the new people and the new staff is going to affect the way that they're able to learn and pick up next year. I just, if you're going to move forward, I really, really feel like you need to prepare your staff and your support staff and the teachers because these kids are going to struggle. So I hope you can reconsider, but if you can't, that's, that's my one as a, as a provider, as a mental health provider, that is my one recommendation that I would give you. So thank you for your time. Thank you.
opinion on a separate sheet that you put out uh, every morning, do you know what you guys want to talk about? Yes, okay. Thank you, board members, for your time. I want to do a quick show of hands. Who has elementary kids on the board? And the person with elementary kids on the board, are your kids being uprooted? Hand up, yes. Hand down, no. My kid is currently at Montessori. So currently where? So not in elementary. So none of your kids are being uprooted. I just wanted to get that out there so people at home listening know that none of your kids are being... That's all I want. Just want to do a quick poll before I start my speech. Uh, thank you for your time uh, and listening to us in regards to transportation. I'm sure you're or you're aware by the uproar of the district that there are many objections to this that applies to the attendance policy and newly created elementary boundary lines. I'm not against the attendance policy, but I am against the way it rolled out so abruptly in the middle of the pandemic. I firmly believe that we can work through this together and still be able to grandfather the students into their current schools. Many of us parents have written promises from school administrators from when our kids were placed in 2018 that they would be at the same school throughout their entire elementary career and that their younger siblings would go there as well when they were placed. Now we have broken promises from school administrators. First, you do not take account of students that who do not use their home address as their bus stop. My kids get picked up their child care provider who is a half mile from the current school before you force them out of it. This is now, this has been our bus stop since we started going to our current provider during the middle of the 2017, 2018 school year. My oldest was in 4K. Our previous prior moved out of state. Uh, secondly, the incoming 4K students at Consolidated must be bused to West where, since there is no 4K program at Consolidated. What I am proposing is allow our current students to be grandfathered into their current schools uh, with some following. Um, Current schools, they must either a have their own transportation. There's a couple suggestions here to, to save on transportation. Either they must a have their own transportation, b be picked up from the current bus stop in their school's boundary lines, or at a bus stop that would get them to the transfer points, such as West students picked up in consolidated area, who would begin on a transfer bus with the 4K students each morning. I know there's going to be some transfer buses in the mix, even with this new plan. So let's work together and put a plan in place that logistically makes sense. As a shipping and logistics manager myself, I know how quickly transportation costs can add up, and I am all for saving money where we can. Just ask my wife. I'm the biggest penny pincher there is. <laughs> I fight my taxes every year. So <laughs> I firmly believe that with the slow rollout of the attendance policy with certain bus stops uh, posted on a map for mass pickup, this could save a lot of money for district-wide and keep everyone happy at the, that the kids are not being uprooted. I'm even willing to help out where needed, and if Rightway isn't performing to the standards we've set for them, it's time to hold them accountable and put their feet to the fire. Or ship them out. Get, get someone else in there. If there's other bus providers we can use. I'll leave you with this final thought as it pertains to our kids district-wide. Picture yourself as a seven-year-old in the district that just completed the second half of the school year at home due to a pandemic. You haven't seen your friends in person for three months. There's no normal in your life right now. And due to a not well thought out decision by our board and administrators, you are now getting moved to a different daycare, different school, and won't be with your friends, classmates that you've known over half your life, just so the school district can save money on buses. You didn't even get to say goodbye. Thank you. So I'm gonna come at this from a policy perspective. Um, you've had a couple of mental health I'm coming to this as a policy person. Um, I make my living uh, as reviewing policies. Um, one of the things that was not fully taken into account is the whole transportation issue and how it affects working parents, especially for us that have to provide and make sure that our kids safely get on a bus, safely get to their school, and safely get home, and make sure that us as parents can do that. Finding childcare is difficult. Um, and, and we struggle as parents. Um, my husband, the independent pensioner is it, he is, when it comes to the safety and the security of our children, we pay for background checks on anybody that we've interviewed 
to be able to watch our kids because that's how important our children are in our lives. So to sit there and tell us that the second ever child care provider that my children have ever had is now not going to be able to watch them and my son is going to lose friends at his daycare school that he's known since he was four years old is kind of heartbreaking because our daycare provider and the other children that are in his school are in there three of them have been in school or been together since they were four so to say that now we have to switch schools and because our daycare provider isn't in our school zone we can't get busing to a new school even though there is going to be a bus going from consolidated to west or you're saying now that my son's gonna get yanked out of Consolidated, which it's a very small school. I mean, probably half of the parents here have kids that go to Consolidated. I mean, that's how tight knit of a school we are. And to say that we can't even be able to keep our kids in the same school, to say that now you're not even gonna let us bus from our daycare providers, because the transportation policy isn't going to allow it is kind of astronomical. I'm not saying that the policy is perfect. There's always going to be hiccups. And to find some type of consensus that people can kind of agree on is probably the better solution than um, where we're at now. Um, I'll leave with one little piece of note. When it comes to compromise, if everybody comes to the table and has an open dialogue, if people leave that table angry, if everybody leaves that table angry, then you've got a good compromise because not one person got their, their full want list. But you give a little, you take a little, and you figure out what's going to work best. We're talking about kids that are from four to about eight or nine. These kids and elementary is going to be the biggest impact in their lives. So this is their chance to make their friends, to have that security, and be able to prepare as they continue to move through the school district. Because they're going to continue to change schools once they go to the intermediate school, once they go to the middle school, and then once they go to high school. And then if they do any post-secondary education. So this is a time that we as parents, especially a close group of parents, need to come to an understanding of where we are tending to be in a little bit more of a unique situation because Consolidated doesn't have a 4K program. And kids are going to be having to adjust to that and being able to not say goodbye to their friends and not being able to say goodbye to their teachers that they've known for the past two or three years. Um, it's, it's difficult as a parent and we, shouldn't have to feel that burden at this point in this particular year. We've been through enough. I've been forced to remote work into home throughout the remainder of this school year and homeschool my children. I can tell you right now, sitting on a conference call with your phone on mute, telling your kids that they need to go into separate spaces and then having Nerf bullets go flying across your living room is not my ideal situation, but I survived it. I did my best and, um, you know, and, and did everything that I could to make sure that my son completed his assignments on time, met with his teachers regularly, and did everything in my power to make sure that he stayed as involved in his school as he could. And I'm committed to continue to fight for him, to keep him in the school where he's gotten to know his, his friends and his teachers, and he's comfortable. So that's all I have. So like a few others that spoke, I am also a child care provider. I'm sorry, I'm gonna get emotional. I'm still postpartum, small baby. Um, but my son was ripped out of his school. I was thankful. I did talk to Mr. Hoffman and uh, Marsha after all this came out, but it was a huge hit to the gut because we are new to the district. We've been here five years now, I think, due to being a single parent. 
I moved into the Milton School District because when my now ex-husband and I first moved to the area, we were deciding between Milton and Evansville and we chose Evansville, but I couldn't substantially stay there on one income. So with his agreement, because he still had an input, we moved to Milton. We've been so pleased being in the Milton School District. Haven't really had any issues. I was able to actually keep watching the kids that I watched from babies on, but with this change, I am going to lose. They're going to have to switch schools. They're going to have to switch childcare providers because they can no longer get on the bus at my school. My son's going to have to go to a new school. Like many said, we just finished up two and a half months of online schooling. And I mean, by the end of it, he was obviously like all of us were tired of everything, but to think about him not getting his weekly messages from Marsha knowing the West way. I mean, we all do it now every Monday we're doing the West way all the time, you know, and my kids laugh, but I'm like, come on, it's gotta be fun. But they're not going to do that. Like if we have to go virtual this fall, like how is he going to, he's not going to know, at least if he started virtual this fall at West, he's going to know, Oh, Mrs. I, Mrs. Bowling, whomever he might have, he's going to at least recognize them on a Google meet or through the videos because he knows their voices. He knows those people. He knows the other kids that have been in his school. Um, and on top of it, I know that transportation was a big thing. And that's why I prefaced with where we came from. Like I had a really good bus company and I will, I called our bus company my first year in the district at Milton because go right way. I don't, I don't know how they're still in business, quite honestly. Like we had ring hand bus service and they are amazing. <coughs> they are a family own business and they know how to run a bus company. I have had nothing but troubles with Go Right Way, including my son almost being hit twice. So I actually opted and made them stop at the, like I made the bus stop, even though he was no longer a kindergartner at our driveway again, because I could not trust that they were controlling traffic and stuff. And it maybe wasn't necessarily the bus driver, but because of just how things are, it's, I just think you guys are putting a lot of weight and a lot of trust in a company that has yet to perform to a level of excellence or even okayness, I guess, if that's even, I mean, really, like every year, like I have to call last year, I spent probably two to three hours on the phone making sure that placements were correct for my three children to actually getting on. And like, they just didn't make sense. And then to make sure that my daycare kids, I'm like, you have one here, one here, like I live on a corner, like that's a bus stop, but they were sending them like two corners down, which doesn't make sense. It's just a lot of things that you guys are putting on this bus company that has not really been doing. I mean, if they were doing a better job, I would say, okay, yeah, I understand that. But they really aren't. I mean, they lost. I did talk to, like I said, um, to one of the board members. And I did let them know we lost our favorite bus driver this last year. And I'm not sure if any of you guys were aware of that. But Jim, our favorite bus driver, who does, does the whole subdivision. I'm not joking. That man is on the bus from whatever time, a.m. until my last kids get off the bus PM, including 4K and everything, he was fired, not fired. He had to quit because they stopped paying him. Like how, how does a bus driver get stop getting paid when he's been there for so many years? And like I said, I, we don't take bus, we don't take the bus drivers for granted. I buy them gifts. I bought them a cute little Yeti cup and said something about bus. I forget now it was something cute about like, you know, sit down and be quiet or you're walking to school or something like that, you know, or listen to Mr. Jim cause it's a long walk home. But like we get them stuff because I, I know it's not a small feat that they are truly getting my kids to and from school safely each and every day. And so I just ask you guys reconsider, especially if you guys are putting so much weight on Go Right Way, who's not really that great. So thank you. Hello. I'm actually remote, so I'm just going to go through a couple of things of note. Um, I'm going to come at this at a little different angle. Um, I understand. I, I don't have my son is goes to Milton West. Um, so, Jim, I, Jim yep. can you hold on just for a second? Oh, sorry. Yeah, we're going to get the volume turned up here to make sure everybody can hear you. We'll let you start over in just a second. All right. Do you want to try turning your volume up here? All right, let's see if that'll. Well, see, yeah, then we've got the squeak. Okay. 
Jim, can you talk again, please? Can you guys hear me now? Mm. Testing one, two. Hang on. Kim, can you hear me? Let's do that. Jim, this is Rich. You can go ahead. Okay. I um, appreciate you guys giving me some time. I'm going to come at this a little bit different angle. Um, my son goes to Milton West. He's currently in first grade, going to be a second grader. Um, I know you guys need to go in one direction or the other. I know we can't stay with where we're at today. Um, so I'm going to kind of propose to you kind of a maybe a happy medium for some. Maybe it's not a happy medium for all. But my proposal is to um, have the 4K students that are coming in either this school year, upcoming school year, or in 2021, 2020, 2022, um, to have them start your new vision, your new process. This way, you guys can meet your overall goals over a three-year time span or three to four-year time span, and you're not impacting any child that's going to Consolidated Harmony East West today. Um, my son has some friends here at Milton West, and I know a couple of his friends are going to be impacted by this overall change if you guys move forward. But I would strongly encourage you to think about that because, you know, I'm guessing if you were to go that route and you gradually, again, gradually make the change over time and just impacting those current or those new 4K students coming in, uh, you know, your numbers are going to, your, your costs are going to go down over time, which is I think a goal of what you guys have at the moment. And I also feel that um, you'll achieve happiness from the current parents that have kids going to their schools. The other thing that I would mention, if you don't want to consider that, is if a, if a parent has a chance to drive their kid to school and pick them up, there's no reason whatsoever why we can't continue doing that here today. So again, I ask you to please reconsider this and think about all those options. I'm planning to join tomorrow and pr can propose that more more detail. Um, I know Richard, I talked with um, the Milton East principal earlier today about my proposal and trying to get some data of what the numbers would be if we were to start this upcoming school year with those 4K students and their siblings going to their new school. Um, is that down to 5%? Is that down to 7% instead of 10 to 15%? What's that number? Again, I know we have to have some change and change is going to happen. It's can you gradually get to that change over time? That's all I have. Very good. Thank you. Uh, that exhausts the lists of folks that had signed up to comment. Um, would be receptive to someone that wanted to that didn't sign up. We'll give you that opportunity. Yes, sir. Just bear with me one second. Carrie, do you want to just gonna get the laptop back open? Jeremy Howler, I reside at 663 Federal Road in Mill Drive. My wife, or my wife, runs a daycare called Tax Daycare. Three next door to Vasky. Um, Howler, I just want to say, you know, in the last few years, the people that pay the school taxes in the city of Melbourne have been have had the burden of cash put on our shoulders by a new referendum. Not that I was against it or anything like that. But 
he had $59.7 million. And now, this is peanuts compared to what you've already asked us to pay. So why are you trying to save peanuts now, yet make us raise our taxes for dollars per year to get your get free dance school. That's, that's, that's my question. This is mean you're saving peanuts to go over our right hand. We're paying $59 million for a new school, bigger school. And you're going to draw the line here and there? I just want to know why you're asking, why, why you're asking them, asking the daycare providers and all the parents who have kids that, like they said, are going to be affected by this. Why would you ask them to make this big of a this big of a sacrifice when we've already made a sacrifice of however much money Millray is for a new school or for, for the new renovations of the school? You know, it doesn't just because we have new renovations, new schools doesn't mean our kids have to have new environments. You know, these small businesses, they care that we go on out of business, like like they said. I, I just that's what I'm putting out there. You know, if we're, if we're good enough to pay the 59.7 whatever million for renovation of school, this is peanuts. You guys should rethink it. Thank you. Okay, we have come to the end of public comment, unless someone desperately wants another crack up there, but I'm going to move forward. Thank you all for your comments. Everyone was very respectful, very courteous. That's how this is supposed to work, so thank you for that. And I'll, uh, I'll reissue the invite, if you will, for tomorrow night. If you're able, please come. Um, I hope to have it uh, much more interactive. Like I said, tonight is a little bit more structured, a little bit more rigid. We can't necessarily answer questions point blank. Hopefully tomorrow we can. And um, we'll have the, uh, the, the people with uh, the data and so forth. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Carrie, for helping assist the technical side there. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> uh, so, like I said, that is cross public comment. Please join us tomorrow night, and we can have another dialogue and hopefully um, gain insight to uh, some of the questions that you've got. Uh, you're all welcome to take the rest of the meeting. If you don't choose to, that's fine. Um, Moving on, uh, item number two is superintendent update from Rich, and he has a couple of bullet points there. Yep, just need to get my mic turned back on. Um, the first thing in the superintendent's update is 2020-21 uh, uh, preliminary budget plan, and we've had some discussions uh, with the board at, at the last few meetings talking about next year's budget and planning for next year's budget. <laughs> Uh, there's a memo that's included in board docs uh, that you can refer to that Kim has pulled up on the screen. Uh, and I'm going to turn things over to walk through the memo to our Director of Business Services, Carrie Bradley. Looks like my head is cut off. Not that I want you to see my full face, but a half a face is not a good option. So, <laughs> so um, uh, the, the point of um, the memo is to kind of uh, summarize things that have been talked about um, at multiple meetings by Superintendent Dahman and to kind of put to paper so that we can um, ha have a document that will summarize what's going on. Um, Superintendent Dahman has been giving verbal reports. So um, the, the point of this really is a high level update on budget planning. There are things that you should be familiar with. And um, the other focus I want to touch on is the idea of controlled revenues and revenue limits as we talk through this document. 
Okay. So uh, originally, uh, we were beginning the year looking at uh, an increase of almost a million dollars in controlled revenues. And, uh, and then um, COVID hit, state revenues went down, and we started looking at different scenarios. Uh, the most hopeful scenario was current law. We get about $300 per member more to work with. Um, there also was the option of no increase, and then there's also the decrease in the per member amount used to calculate revenue limits and controlled revenue. I want to take just a minute. I, I think we've done some talking about this before, about how revenue limits work. So at a high level, revenue limits control um, the amount of money that a district can raise through property taxes. It's based on uh, prior year controlled revenue, number of students, and there's a calculation. So uh, oftentimes what happens when the state revenues go down, then the state's commitment to state aid that they had made in the, under current law, they're concerned they're not going to be able to make that commitment. So if our equalization aid goes down, they use the revenue limit so that property taxes don't go up because the revenue limit is always balancing those two pieces. So um, when we're talking about the $300 per member, that would be our, um, what's referred to as a multiplier. So we could look at that multiplier being, we're a low revenue district, so that's actually a combination of two different pieces, right? It's the 170 something plus our low revenue difference. Um, other districts will be talking about 179, but we were looking at 300. So that 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 uh, multiplier uh, could be um, that it could be zero, um, or in a prior year they actually made it negative uh, several years ago. So um, there's some some numbers or details in there that kind of tell you the dollar amounts we're looking at. So we were looking at an increase of over a million. We understand that we have a deficit budget this year. So we wouldn't have to get to a balanced budget. We wouldn't have all of that money available. Um, the no increase scenario, we're looking at reductions of the uh, current year's deficit. And then if you go to the reduction scenario, we're moving in the, the, the cut direction almost as much as we had been moving in the increase direction, depending upon which scenario we're looking at. And uh, over time, um, it seems more likely that this no uh, increase in controlled revenues uh, may become um, real, um, or there may actually be a decrease. Uh, so um, um, as we plan our budget and as we go through the planning process, we're always working with the information that we have at a point in time. And we have estimates, and then we will continue to, to modify those estimates as more information becomes available. Um, also, uh, just to be... Um, efficient and effective in the use of taxpayer dollars. We are looking for efficiencies and, and cost savings that uh, we can find. And so, um, as you know, previously, if we, when we move 4Ks to our building, we'll no longer be paying rent in a facility that's not our own. Uh, we also talked at a previous meeting about how uh, we are going to be able to move the purchase of an elevator from that capital improvement budget to referendum dollars based on how bids came through. So that became part of the referendum project, which was a, a appropriate use of the funds as well. Uh, we are also um, looking at print services to figure out how we can save money on copy machines and, and printing costs and things of that nature. So these things are going on anyway before uh, we were looking at the severe, potential severe reduction. So just kind of, it's, it's not that we're out looking for savings because we're in this situation. Right? We were actively looking before so that we can provide the best we can with the resources that we have. And then uh, finally, um, as our um, conversations go about what potential reductions might look like, uh, administrators are reviewing their current budget plans, uh, discussing possible areas or items uh, for consideration of reductions, not necessarily proposing reductions, but if I have to talk about looking at something, what are some of the focus areas that we could look at? And also, uh, when we have a staff vacancy, we are analyzing those vacancies to see if they do need to be posted right away, if we can wait. Um, we, one of the concerns with delaying is that it will have a negative impact on recruiting and filling a vacancy. So uh, any vacancy that we have, we're also 
um, doing that analysis piece as well. So um, as we as we go through the cycle, obviously we will continue to to update as best we can with the information that we have. And uh, Superintendent Damon, you had some additional comments you wish to share? Sure, just a, a couple things to. What's that? Yeah. There's a couple things to, re to reinforce. One is the importance of having a balanced budget. We, uh, this current year, as, as Carrie mentioned, we are, are spending more. Our, our planned budget was to spend more than our income uh, from the state. And there's sometimes, some years there's good reasons for that, but it isn't a sustainable model. Uh, we've spent down our, our fund balance over the years. So we need to make sure that as we're planning for the coming year that we have a balanced budget. Uh, we have in our, uh, Discussions with our staff put uh, staff salary increases on pause for the coming year until we know whether we will get additional funding from the state or not. Uh, so all of our staff are in the same position there as far as looking at a, a freeze in their salary potentially for the coming year unless the state does uh, provide us some additional funds. In conversation with uh, uh, some people at the state level, uh, one of the comments that was made was the only way uh, that we'll be able to avoid significant uh, K-12 cuts across the state is if the federal stimulus stimulus money uh, comes out to state. So it's something that we're keeping an eye on, something that could still happen. Uh, we're optimistic, but the state of Wisconsin is uh, estimating a be between a two and three billion dollar budget shortfall for this fiscal year. Um, so uh, again, we don't know where that end result will be. I think Carrie explained the different scenarios that we're looking at. We're kind of moving as time has gone on away from that best case scenario being the, the additional funds that, that had been approved in the previous biennium. Uh, that's becoming less and less likely to happen. Uh, and now it's becoming more uh, hopeful that we'll be able to at least not have a, uh, a decrease in our, in our pure, per pupil funding uh, and maybe a freeze uh, is what we're hoping for, but the possibility of uh, up to even a $200 per, per pupil decrease in funding from the states is from the state is becoming very real. Uh, and we're looking as we're budgeting, looking at multiple scenarios uh, for that budgeting. We really have a goal to uh, as we're looking at different places to uh, reduce our budget for next year as needed, uh, a goal to uh, not have to uh, lay off staff, a goal to try to keep uh, small class sizes as much as possible and keep uh, our extracurricular offerings for students as much as possible. But again, there's a lot of uncertainty there depending on uh, what happens from the state. So if there are any questions, thoughts, comments from the board for either Carrie uh, or I on that topic. So, Carrie, um, I just want to make sure I, I fully understand this. Um, and I know we've talked about this a number of times, but uh, sometimes my uh, short-term memory fails me, uh, getting a little old. Um, so current law, the happy path, we'd get a million dollars extra in revenue compared to last year. Additional revenue authority, yes. Yes. And that would be in aid, right? State aid or? It would be a combination. Of aid and, aid and okay. Okay, so if there's no increase, so we basically stay at the revenue limit we are at today, right, right? And, but what needs to be considered in that, if I understand this right, is we were about $160,000 deficit last year, which means if nothing changed on our expenses, this year, that'd be another $160,000 deficit if nothing changed. If we don't have a balance. Right, correct. Um, and we that would mean that our staff would have to um, endure the pause for the, the entire year. And 
we would also have to well we're going to have extra costs for the additional space to maintain and whatnot um and extra staff for the extra space that we were creating right right so if we had no increase which is kind of looking what like it is i mean right now i think it's fair safe to say that this past year we had a hundred sixty thousand dollar deficit but if we don't get if nothing happens and we get the same revenue limit we're probably looking at a much 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 higher uh deficit or cut something That's typically how you get to, yes, a balanced budget. You have to prioritize and, and work right. to get or, or a bigger deficit, right? right. Yes. yes. Which we don't want to do. But, um, but again, it's a budgeted deficit, not an experience deficit, because we're always budgeting with the information we have at a point in time. Right, right, right. right. So I just want to kind of, yeah. the answer is um, yes, but there's always more right, to the story. Right. Um, and this, is, this has nothing to do with any of the conversation we had tonight, because I don't know. Because if we want to get to a balanced budget and we have to cut something, I'm not prepared to say what should be cut and what shouldn't be cut. But do you have a, I know this is pretty premature, but do you have a ballpark kind of a gut feeling? It can even be in the ballpark parking lot. It doesn't have to actually be in the ballpark of what that, I guess, what that deficit would be that we would have to cut to bring it more of a, at a balance. Okay. Um, I would say, I, I'm guessing you probably don't because we don't know what with, you know, with the staffing and, you know, when the pause is going to go off and on um, the salaries and stuff. But. but if we just take that increase piece, right? Yeah. If we get no increase, then we'd have to reduce by 170,000 to get to a balanced budget. Yeah. If they I, do the zero piece. Yeah, I think you're going to have to do more than that though. Right, because we're going to have to have extra costs associated with uh, the buildings and you're line iteming it. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm I'm trying to right. follow you and and yeah. really this is this is a higher level conversation and every yeah. budget year, right? You are you you are going to look for more efficiencies, right? right? And you've already identified a few few things that we can take out of the budget that we were planning on originally, and one of them is that elevator, and that's a one time yeah. purchase. So. Um, you always have competing uh, interests for for the funds. Yeah. So, um, but but again, the intention of this was a higher level higher yeah. level conversation right now to let you know what we're working on, and and just what that might look. Okay. Like. Yeah, and, and like I said, it's probably a little too premature right now because I mean, we don't even have the other budget completed yet. Um, but you know, it, it's. For me, it's always a good thing to know, okay, what are we looking at as far as um, how much we're gonna have to find, how, what's the value amount of what kind of cuts we have to find. Um, you know, it's 160 right now, but it's probably gonna be more than that because we're gonna add expenses and then mm -hmm. we have to make up for that too, so. Right. And, and okay. sometimes you'll have ins and outs just naturally, yeah. right? You, you will have someone who changes from a family plan to a single plan. You will have someone uh, leave that had a higher salary than, than the person you're replacing them with. So this stuff is always fluid and really always moving. And sometimes it moves throughout the year as people live their lives. So um, there's, there's a lot of moving parts. And um, right now we're, we're working with the, the scenario for now. We take current year's budget yeah. as a base. And then August, we'll know more um, as far as how this budget played out. Uh, we'll know more about what our staffing needs are going to be uh, and, and things of that nature. But um, any staff that is now is really, uh, if we hire, they're replacing an existing person. So it's not like we're at increasing our total right. staff. So, so there's some pieces that are in place from actions that were taken before, right? When we set the baseline for staff. Um, when it, the insurance decision was made, that has a budget impact, which we're still going to have to wait to see how that, um, how that, how that works out, you know, overall. 
because there were a couple moving parts in that one too. So I don't know if I'm really answering your question other than to tell you there's a lot of moving parts and we're monitoring them and, and working on the numbers as best we can. Yeah. But at this point, we are really at a high, high level still. So I can add one, just one thing quick to that. It's just, um, there's a lot of moving pieces to it. So I like to take things and just say, well, what does that mean in a nutshell? In a nutshell, we had anticipated prior to the economic downturn across the country that we would get about a million dollars in additional revenue for the coming year. That's what the legislature had approved uh, in the last biennium. Because of the economic downturn, we're anticipating that we not only won't get a, that amount, that we will either get frozen uh, at our current spot uh, or potential reductions uh, to our revenue. When the revenue side of the, of the scale goes down, then the expenditure side of the scale has to go down. Uh, for us, we're starting with a mismatch scale. Uh, as Carrie mentioned earlier, uh, our spending is $170,000 higher this year than our revenue. So if this goes down, we have to not only decrease it to match this, but an additional $170,000 plus whatever those fixed costs are. Uh, so we're being very cautious with our uh, plans, our budgeting plans for the coming year. Uh, we're paying attention to what's happening at the Capitol. We are advocating for the importance of funding uh, public education. I think we provide a great service uh, to our community and our families, uh, but we are a little bit at the whims of both the federal government and the state government right now on how that will all turn out. And the other piece that, that we didn't mention is it's unlikely that this is gonna be just a one year uh, issue. It's likely that the economic downturn is gonna take a while at the state level and the federal level to come back uh, to where it was. So we're anticipating that it isn't just live through this year and then everything will be fine again. We're anticipating uh, to be to be prudent uh, planners. We're anticipating that we may be in this downturn for a couple years. Rich, I just have a question. Uh, so we're saying Where we where we put that that discussion right now is that that discussion is still pending. We haven't done any of that negotiating uh, because of the uncertainty, and it really is a pause for everyone at the place where they were this current fiscal year. Yeah, it, it doesn't mean that we can't go back and revisit that this summer, uh, no matter what uh, we hear from the state. And there are different districts that take different approaches to that. Some say uh, we should uh, give our staff some increase. And if that means we have to decrease staff to be able to do that, and I know that there are some districts that are taking that approach. It's not necessarily something that I agree with, and it's, but it's something that we'll have to discuss as a board. Other districts are saying we want to keep all of our staff in place, but to do that, if we're not getting new revenue, we can't increase salaries for them. So uh, I guess the, the gist of your question was, um, have we looked at any of those different pieces that make up the teacher salaries and all of those things for right now are on pause with the idea that we would revisit those uh, in the upcoming months as we know more. I just want to add one thing for Brian's kind of comment. Um, there's only three of us on the board from when we made the last budget. And one of the things to keep in mind is the pool. So we had that expense that was not budgeted originally, but then we agreed that it would put us over budget um, to keep our pool open and servicing our community and our kids. So that was a one-time cost prior to us having our referendum dollars to fix it. Now, some of the referendum dollars were able to be used, I think, on some of the equipment, but not all of it. So that does factor into that deficit that we had. But I thought that was on the 2018-2019 uh, budget because it was done in 2019-February, uh, that initial. I know and remember, kind of, right? My memory's that good. I know that some of that was like kind of straddled the, the um, the fiscal periods, and I thought 
a big portion of that, like the, the exchange was on the 2018, 2019 budget, and the other one was on the, was being budgeted in 2019. 2020. Yeah, so I know there's, Carrie could probably itemize it better than me, but I know there was lapse too. Like yeah. we, we knew it was gonna impact us not being balanced going into that. Um, the other thing, I can't speak to that particular issue, but the other thing to keep in mind is we don't find out open enrollment until this much right, before right, you right. have to left. Right, and that's going to impact okay. everything. And, that's, and, and that number changes all year long. So, so you know, we work toward a balanced budget for, for providing services for the children that attend here. And then in, in, in October, you get this open the open enrollment figure and sometimes it's a positive and sometimes it's a negative and there's only so much planning you can do for that as you impact so just kind of keep that piece in mind remember how we talked about as information becomes available okay open enrollment finally stopped changing i think two weeks ago kim yeah so um that but that one can also kind of throw you one way or the other because it hits revenues and expenses and I'm not sure about the situation here, but a lot of times that one is the the wild wildest wild card of the wild cards. And I that. I. There's on, on that topic of uncertainty, there are a couple other things we talked about on the revenue side, but we do have a number of things on the expenditure side with some uncertainty. I think Diamond's point about uh, one one time expenses is important. A really good example of that in our upcoming budget is that elevator project. We initially thought that we would have to fit into fit that into next year's regular budget, but uh, because we had some savings in the bids in our in our high school project uh, with the referendum, we we're able to put it into the referendum, pay for it out of that fifty nine million dollar referendum, and then it doesn't eat up space uh, in next year's budget. Uh, a couple of other pieces of uncertainty for the coming year uh, are around what the back to school plans will look like and that's that i'll get to some more specifics on that in the next part of this agenda but the financial impact of that depends on uh what are the requirements or expectations for providing uh pr protection equipment for students and staff what does transportation look like in the fall uh, are we able to fill a school bus with the same number of kids or do we have to increase the number of routes so that we can have kids sitting every other seat in the bus. And a lot of those things are not determined yet. Uh, another big part of our revenue every year is dependent both on our regular enrollment, but also on our summer school enrollment. Summer school started today. Today was our first day of summer school. Through the month of June, we're only able to offer virtual summer school. And we in the past have had a, a very robust summer school offerings. The more students that you have in summer school, that impacts your uh, revenue for the, for the upcoming year. Uh, we're anticipating that that's gonna be down for this year. Summer school enrollment will be down. We're pretty certain that it will be. Um, right now, we're looking at about a third of our usual revenue, in part because we aren't able to offer some of the same things. Another part is people, students and families are tired of virtual school and they need a break. And I understand that. Uh, we're thinking that in July and August, we might be able to offer some on-site options for families that want to do that with small groups and staying distant and continue to offer some virtual options but and and really focus in august on uh trying to fill the gap in for students that may have fallen behind in areas like math and reading this spring and also work on transitions for students who are going to new schools not just any students who might be at a new school because of our change in plans but students who are moving new to our district and students who are moving from third grade to fourth grade who will be new at north side new at the middle school or new at the high school we want to really make sure that we're providing them opportunities to learn their new school and be ready for the start of the school year 
all of those different things impact our budget in one way or another. And there's a lot of question marks around all of those things. So we will continue to bring information to the board uh, at every meeting and to the community about where we are with budgeting. As we get new information from the state, we'll hopefully, if it's good news, uh, we'll, we'll bring that with a smile. And if it's bad news, we'll come with a plan on how we're going to address that. So any other questions, comments, thoughts from board members on the budget topic? If not, the other piece of, of the superintendent's update is on planning for the upcoming school year. And it's really around the latest update on where we are with um, planning for bringing students and staff back into our buildings. And our number one priority is making sure that we have plans in place to do that in a safe way for our students, for our staff, and for our families. Uh, through June 30th, we're still uh, our school district and every school district in the state is still under the ruling from the Supreme Court that ended the Safer at Home Act but extended it for public schools. That's still in place through June 30th and in, an, in basically it says that we can't provide any student instruction or extracurriculars in any of our schools or on any of our school sites or facilities. So through the end of June, we're restricted. We can bring people in for things like this. This isn't student instruction. It's not extracurricular activity. We need to follow safety guidelines when we do things like this, but we're allowed to do that. After July 1st, there aren't any laws in place for what we do. There's some recommendations that Rock County has put out. Rock County has their a phased plan uh, for returning. Um, it's unlikely, we're being told that it's unlikely that the state legislature will come out with any law. They're the group that makes laws and they've kind of indicated that they wanna stay out of it and leave it to local uh, public health officials and leave those decisions uh, to local school districts with guidance from those other groups. We're expecting guidance from uh, the Department of Public Instruction or DPI at the state level from the Department of Health Services or DHS and from Rock County Public Health. Um, today, as I mentioned, summer school has started and we're doing that virtually through the rest of this month. We also have some typical summer programs that want to get going as soon as they can. Uh, we have a strong FFA program that has a lot going on in the summer. Our summer music programs are typically very, very active and busy. Um, we also have a lot of people using our facilities in the summer, outside groups that use our schools, our grounds, and some people aren't aware that Schoberg Park is a school district facility. So we have to have guidelines in place for groups that want to use our facilities. And uh, what we've been telling people is that uh, we're restricting that through the end of June, but that if guidelines from Rock County and the state allow us to have outside groups come in or start some of our groups, we wanna have plans in place to be able to do that. Um, in general, it's really weighing those risks of safety. So the board needs to be alert of, uh, we can't stop doing the things that we do. We have a responsibility to educate our students. Uh, so we wanna look at how can we do that in as safe a way possible while being alert to the risks. One note that we've gotten from Rock County, they're in, in their phase plan, they're in phase one right now, uh, that isn't uh, allowing really anything uh, special for school districts. Uh, they are saying that they're expecting that they may be moving into phase two fairly soon. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if something comes out in the next couple of weeks saying that Rock County is moving into phase two. Again, for schools, the recommendation is to follow, re follow what the state guidelines are. But one of the things that phase two in Rock County does is it takes a limit now of 25% of capacity in, in uh, public meetings and bumps it up to 50%. And that might be something we use as a guideline if we're coming back to summer school. If we have a classroom rather than having 20 kids in a classroom, can we have 10 so that they're spaced out if we're in phase two? So that's something that we're alert to. Down the road, we're hoping that they get to uh, phase three. Phase three is, is much more open. 
Um, one of the pieces that people are asking a lot about is what will athletics look like, both for summer work and for this fall. Uh, phase two uh, is, is saying maybe some with social distancing. And there's obviously some things that you can do uh, for training and athletics with social distancing. There's some that you can't. Phase three, we're looking at more of that competitive piece if we're in, if we're in that spot. Um, a couple other things, the guidance from the state, from DPI and DHS, they're calling education forward. And they've been clear that it's not going to be a requirement for districts. It's going to be guidance or recommendations. Um, we are working with area, other area school districts, because while we don't have to do the same thing as our neighboring school districts, and they don't have to do the same thing as us, I think it's really important that we all are alert to what the other districts are doing. Many of our uh, people that, uh, parents of our students work in other school districts. Many of our staff uh, live in other school districts. So being alert to what plans are being in place from our neighbors, I think is gonna be important. And we've been in communication with them. Most of them are planning what we are is keeping the board informed through June. And then at the first board meeting in July, bringing a proposal to the school board for the rest of the summer and what the, the school year, uh, the start of the school year could look like. We have had planning teams going for a considerable amount of time. We're hesitant to put together really detailed plans because as soon as we do, the state will come out with something saying, we don't recommend what you just shared with your community and then we have to backtrack. So we are doing some planning. Our, our hope is really that the day that that plan comes from the state, that that guidance comes from the state, we're able to really dig into our drafts of our plans, firm them up and have them ready to be shared. Some different topic areas that we're working on are instruction, operations, governance, wellness, technology and operations. And uh, next steps are to continue those conversations with local health authorities, with our community partners, uh, community, continued communication with parents, students, staff, and community stakeholders. We've been trying to put blurbs in the Red Hawk Review, our weekly newsletter for parents, uh, about uh, what's been happening around uh, returning to school. Now that school is out, we're gonna continue through the summer sending that out. Uh, we're gonna switch it to every two weeks instead of every week. Uh, so last Friday, we sent out a Red Hawk review. So the next one will be coming, uh, not this Friday, but the following. But if there's big news that comes out, we won't wait two weeks to get that out to people. We'll get that out uh, as soon as we know it. And then we're planning at the next school board meeting on June 22nd to give another update. And then on the first board meeting in July, on July 13th, uh, to bring that plan, including the the, the areas that I just highlighted, but also how we will handle screening of staff and students uh, when they show up for school, ensuring that they're not uh, bringing any uh, communicable diseases with them, uh, how we're handling social distancing, uh, personal protective equipment, how we're handling our facility use. And I mentioned on the budget piece, how we're handling transportation. Uh, there's a lot of concerns that we've heard from parents about will we be expecting that we'll load uh, 50 students onto a school bus and, and have them sitting two or three on a seat. So that's something that we're continuing to, to work on and we're very hopeful. And we've been told that that, um, that plan from the state will have some information, some recommendations on transportation. We know that we'll have to adjust as we learn new things. I know that as some restrictions have come into place, there's been more people out and intermingling. Uh, and I think the next couple of weeks, we're going to learn more about if that does show a, a increase in the spread. And I think that will kind of influence some of the, the people at the state that are going to provide those guidelines. So uh, I realize that was a lot of information and, and uh, but I want the board and the community to be aware of the work that's been going on and, and uh, what's coming up. So again, any board questions, comments? Thoughts? I think we're good. Thanks, Rich.
there, my bad. Um, and Mike joins us once a month to uh, update us on sort of what has happened uh, and where we're at and what's going to happen probably in the near term. So that process has changed uh, building by building, week by week, depending on where they are in the schedule. And I would turn that over to Mike if you are tuned in and welcome. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? And we are going to struggle with that volume too, I bet. Yeah, can you can you hear me? Yes, that's better. Okay. Um, actually, I'll unplug my headphone and just use the computer mic. Tell me if it's any better. How's that? Any better? You're, you're muted, Joe. Maybe I should be all muted. <laughs> okay. Well, I hope you can hear me. I've got just a short report for you today. Um, we're in a, a, a mode where there's uh, much diminished activity uh, in the administrative side, and uh, it really just has been focused on the construction activity uh, since my last report to the board. Um, and that's, uh, that's a good spot to be in. Um, everything is going quite well uh, at the elementary schools. Um, if you've seen it from afar, you've uh, noticed now that it's been essentially closed in at East and West and Harmony uh, uh, for some time now. And uh, uh, finishes, finish activity is happening inside uh, in the remodel spaces. Uh, they're actually installing drywall, uh, having a uh, uh, put in steel stud walls and all the mechanicals roughed in. Um, so it's nice to get to a finished material there. Actually doing painting on the masonry walls in the additions. Uh, and we've, we finally got the uh, item that uh, was holding our schedule up a little bit. Uh, we took delivery of windows over at East Elementary School uh, just in the last week. Uh, so those are, those are going into place now. That, of course, will finalize the, uh, the building enclosure and allow us to do uh, activities that, uh, with materials that uh, could, could capture moisture if we didn't have full enclosure. So they are running some temporary dehumidification in those buildings to facilitate the finish work. Uh, so that's good. Over at the middle school, um, footing and foundation work is, uh, is well underway. Uh, basically, the whole perimeter of uh, that new addition, uh, the footings and foundations are done and they're working on some of the interior, uh, interior footing and foundation work. Over at the high school, uh, there's been quite a bit of progress. Uh, obviously we take up a big footprint there, both over at the STEM edition uh, and the pool edition. So STEM, STEM edition, uh, you guys had authored a, authorized a uh, early bid package there to get the excavation and underground uh, structure work done. So that is well underway. Over at the pool, the site uh, has been leveled out and prepped. Uh, and when I was last there, the, uh, uh, the company that will do the uh, install the geo piers uh, was not yet on site. Uh, but I'm hoping when I go there tomorrow that I'll see them on site. Um, and that, of course, is a, a key piece uh, to get done before we can start uh, the actual structure of the pool. Uh, there's a little bit of remodeling that is happening at the high school. Uh, the administrative offices were uh, uh, asbestos abatement and demolition was accomplished, and uh, that's, that's now coming back together. Uh, so that's the update on the construction progress. Um, I can tell you that uh, in my last report, I talked about the, uh, the bids for the high school and uh, how that was largely good news. We are conducting our, uh, what I'll call our budget summit tomorrow. And this is just an opportunity to get uh, a number of people in the room, uh, certainly uh, Stephen and Carrie, uh, myself and Steve Claven. Uh, and really to check all the numbers now that the, uh, the, all of the big pieces have fallen into place, uh, just to have a dialogue back and forth, make sure we have captured everything in the master project budget report, 
um, and, and really have accounted for all the dollars. Uh, the, the assumption is that yes, we have, uh, but it's good to do uh, this, this check now that I, as, as I said, all the big pieces have fallen into place. And uh, that's all I have to report. Any questions? Very good. Thank you, Mike. And uh, we'll look forward to your next update. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, item four is transportation committee report. Uh, that's chaired by Dave Holterman. We met last week, and I'm going to let Dave share with you what that committee's discussions involved. All right. Thank you, Joe. A um, couple quick updates. Going to cover our first uh, item here myself and then enlist the help of uh, Jen Kramer and Carrie Bradley for part of it as well. Um, for 4A, uh, policy 8600, uh, was a, a high-level overview discussion on our requirements as it relates to state and federal statutes and transportation of students. Uh, that was a review document um, and I think insightful on just the high level things that are expected of us as a district. Um, more into the granular, granular level of it, um, for 4B, going to move on. Uh, uh, Mrs. Kramer, I think, is going to cover the uh, 4K component of that discussion as well. And so, Jen, are you on? Sure. <clears throat> um, so this is going to maybe feel a little bit lengthy, but I think it's going to help build some understanding for people on where um, we went with 4K. Um, first thing I want to point out um, is our uh, transportation, um, and Carrie can probably speak better to this, or you too, Rich, but uh, over a million dollars a year we spend on transportation in the school district of Milton. Um, the conversation earlier, I heard some people um, with some concerns that they have. So I just want to kind of paint a picture of how we've evolved uh, in the 4K world in regards to transportation. So we started the 4K program here in Milton. It was a community-based program uh, back in 2011, 2012, so eight years ago. Community-based means that these um, sites were in some of our churches and some of our daycares, but essentially spread across our community. We, um, it was only, transportation was only offered in the AM for families. So if you were a family that needed transportation, then automatically your student would be placed in that AM section. Um, back in 2017, 2018, the school district started offering transportation uh, for equity purposes to both families that were in the AM or PM. So placement became a little bit, um, I'm going to use the word easier or equal for all families. So you could have AM or PM and transportation was provided. Uh, one year later, 2018 and 19, because here in our community we had some advocates that were running in-home daycares, we're looking um, to make sure that we as a school district would bus students to all daycare providers and not just um, some of the larger ones that we know in our community. For example, Small Wonders or Tammy's Tender Times, but for people like uh, Leah sitting here in front of me, Zasties and um, Holly's and go on and on. So any in-home daycares. So that started happening in 2018-19. Um, now I'm going to um, talk about last year. So we moved the majority of our 4K classrooms over to the 4K center, we call it, but located under the roof of Small Wonders. And what that looked like for a 4K student in the area of transportation, and I'm just going to use the end of the day for an example so you all know what this looked like. Um, the bell, quote unquote, rings at 320 over at the Small Wonders Center. Uh, students who are riding the bus would get on um, one, I'm going to talk about East and West students to better understand some of this transfer stuff. So students would get on the bus at 320, four or five year olds over at the Small Wonders or 4K Center. They would ride over to Milton East. If you are a student that was um, residing on the East attendance area, those students would get off, come into our school, get in their respected bus lines to then be bused home. Simultaneously, and then the 4K students that live on the west side of town would sit and wait on that bus, okay? So now the east students would get off, they would join in their lines at the same time my bell is ringing at the end of the school day at Milton East at 
So all of the school age kids are either going to get picked up or joining those 4K students in that line who are standing so nicely waiting patiently to then get on their home bus, okay? At the same time, this, something's happening over at West that all of the kids that are residing over at Milton West are getting, their, meaning they attend school at Milton West but reside on the east side of town, are getting on a transfer bus to come over to East to then get on those home routes, okay? Now I'm gonna back up just a little bit. So I told you that those um, 4K students that were going over to West, they're sitting on that bus, my students join them, and then they cross over to go over to Milton at West to then get off and then get on their home routes. So my point here is as a system, we were expecting a lot out of these four, five, six, seven year olds for those kids that were having to transfer across town. So when we started looking at uh, 4K, right, and bringing them back into the schools, now that we have this referendum and we have more space, part of that conversation was being able to eliminate some of the confusion and um, things that we were trying to make our 4K students remember. So for example, honey, now tonight at the end of the day, remember you're gonna get on 119 and then you're gonna go over to West and then you're gonna get on 124. So point being trying to uh, minimize some of that confusion for not only the 4K students, but families and staff as well. So um, one thing I did also forget to mention is that the board also approved in August of 2019 that we would provide transportation for all 4K students. Because at that time, what we knew was that the majority of our 4K sections were located at that 4K center. And if you know where that is, it's across the street from, I'll say, Piggly Wiggly or Janesville Street. And um, I don't think there's many of us sitting in this room or watching today that would find that safe to have a four-year-old across the street to attend uh, the 4K center. So the board approved that in 2019. Um, and the other thing that we talked about, Dave, that I just wanted to highlight on is that flexibility that we would be able to offer our 4K families in the coming year, meaning next school year, now that we have 4K in those three elementary schools, the flexibility with that midday route. So we all know that the 4K through sixth grade come in together in the morning just like it is this year, the midday route is only 4K students, okay? And so um, looking at that flexibility to bus those 4K students outside of their attendance area, okay? So now I didn't say that they would have the flexibility on the front end of the day or the end of the day. Those are attendance boundaries, but the midday. So here's an example just to help you better understand. If you had a... Um, second grader at East and a 4 k -er. And I live in the East area. So I was fortunate enough that I don't start work until nine o'clock, so I'm just gonna give you an example. I'm able to drop my two students off at Milton East, okay? 4 k -er, second grader. And they go on the playground, I go to work. So at that midday route, I need to get my 4 k -er to a daycare center. And it just so happens that I utilize, um, I'll just use Leah for an example, over at the Zasties, which is located on the west side of town. My 4 k -er would be able to get bussed to the west side of town, which is outside of the attendance area. Because of the flexibility with that 4 k route, they're the only students on that bus, okay? So that's something we had talked about um, at that transportation committee meeting. And uh, the board will continue to look at, um, you know, ways that we can help accommodate some of these changes that we've made. Does that highlight what you recall, Dave? Yes. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well. Um, Okay, what the AG 8600 draft, what that means is, is that we're uh, writing down the details of what the policy 8600 is telling us. So basically following the law, 
and what that looks like for students that are eligible for transportation. Uh, one of the things also during this whole process uh, that we were looking at is how do, um, to minimize some of this um, confusion that we have for families not only coming in but going home is limiting the amount of addresses that they're being bused to. So a lot of times what we have is um, either split families or grandmas on this day and daycare on this day. And so uh, looking at look like um, making it easier for families, staff and students to lessen the confusion. And so uh, dual households, just looking at some of that eligibility criteria. Did that inadvertently? I apologize for that. Sorry about that. Um, can you hear me now? Uh, another item that was discussed at the Transportation Committee was uh, parochial transportation. Uh, this is an item I did not have a lot of background on. Uh, and Carrie Bradley gave a, an insightful background and example of the impacts overall. Um, Carrie, are you able to talk about that item in a bit more detail? Thank you. Sure. Um, there are two pieces. Uh oh, I'm in the room. I'm confused. Um, there's, there's two pieces to the parochial transportation. Uh, our current parent con, the law requires that we provide transportation to private schools that are within five miles of our boundaries. We have two of them. Um, one is St. Paul's in Janesville and one is um, uh, St. Mary's in Janesville as well. And then we also have a private school that is, is uh, within our boundaries. Okay. So to meet the obligation to provide transportation, the law allows us to uh, contract with parents for transportation. Uh, so in essence, uh, there's a um, administrative rule that tells us how to calculate the amount of money they get. And um, that is a, on an annual basis. And uh, based on our experiences this year, we're looking at moving toward a contract that's based on a daily basis. So we'll do the statutory calculation to get the amount. We'll look at um, that rate on a daily basis, and then we're going to add another layer of potentially of attendance as well. So, and then the, the second piece, as I said, um, we have two schools in Janesville. One is St. Paul's and one is St. Mary's. We currently have a bus route going to St. Mary's, and it goes from St. Mary's to Harmony. And we're going to look at doing parent cont contracts for to meet that need as well. And we'll meet our statutory obligations to provide transportation. It's just another way of doing that. And then um, the, um, the, so rather than sending a bus to St. Mary's for, um, I don't know, less than 10 kids, we'll do parent contracts for that. Okay. Did you have any questions or does that sound familiar? No, that, that summarizes it well as I, as I recall. I if I can add one, just one point of clarity okay. on that. Um, I think Carrie mentioned it, but I know that there's a St. Mary's in Milton, and it's, I want to make sure that people understand we're referring to St. Mary's School in, in Janesville. Oh. And uh, at, a, at one time, it made sense for us to send a bus to that school. We had a larger number of students who were taking part in that school. Uh, as that has decreased, it does make more sense for us rather than having a bus uh, take that small number of students there uh, to just reimburse through a contract with the parents for that transportation. Thank you for the additional clarification. Uh, another item discussed, uh, Transportation Committee, was the contract with Go Right Way. Um, again, Carrie mentioned earlier that we're in the middle of a contract with them, but uh, uh, she gave some good insights as it relates to some efficiencies. For example, what happens when you don't bus kids in the, in the time of uh, a COVID pandemic and things like that. Um, Carrie, like I said, I found your your commentary insightful. Uh, you know, if you have anything you'd like to add to that as it relates to the on, ongoing contra contract issue. Thank you. Maybe one thing, one thing that I'd like to add on that is just clarifying, we are in the middle of a, a multi-year contract with Go Right Way. Uh, we, every year during that contract though, we meet at this time of year and look at uh, the number of routes that we uh, are planning for the coming year, uh, any changes to the transportation uh, system, 
And there's a lot of different pieces. We think about the, the main transportation system, getting students to school and getting students home from school. But we also provide uh, transportation for students on IEPs and uh, transportation for our different extracurricular activities too. So that all is part of our uh, contract with Go Right Way. And I don't know, Carrie, is there anything else that you wanted to add on that topic? Uh, just that we're preparing to engage in the conversation of the the routes and the costing in this annual meeting we have, and um, what will they will be able to produce will be based on what our expectations are. So as we continue to clarify our transportation need expectations and uh, look at students, then we'll be uh, better prepared to to have that conversation with them. Very good. Thank you. I have, I have a question on that if you don't mind. Um, so we're just beginning to uh, start the contract talks for a multi-year contract with Go Right. Is, did I hear that right? No, that's a, that's a good clarifier. Our contract began in 2018. So 2018-19 is the first school year that that contract was effective. So the terms of the overall contract are not being renegotiated. We're having a conversation about our needs for next year and then applying the terms of the contract and then seeing what else we might wish to discuss. Okay, so we don't, we don't necessarily have a multi-year contract with them. We, we do a contract on a yearly basis. No, no we, we have a five-year contract. Five year, okay, okay, that's what I was looking for. Oh, sorry, did I leave that out? I'm sorry, no, I'm no, you're, we're, you're good. sunsetting okay. here. We're, um, going into, we're going into the third year of the five-year okay. contract with them. <laughs> Okay, that, that explains it, and I, I would assume that once the five years is up, we'd probably do some competitive bidding, I would I would imagine. Typically, when we get into that last year, we start looking at what other, what other options are available during that year, and then uh, make a decision on either moving to somebody new or staying with them and using a bid process for that. Yep. Okay, that's a couple of years away, though. So, yep. okay. thank you. Each route costs in general uh, about $45,000. Uh, so when we look at being able to have fewer routes, that's, that's the ballpark figure that we use. Uh, it ties in a little bit to our conversation about uh, plans for next year because we've, as we've looked at uh, potential savings for next year, uh, in the planning with Go Right Way, they've anticipated that we'd be able to have two to four fewer routes for next year. So at about $45,000 per route, it would be in the um, 90 to $180,000 range uh, in savings. Um, and then there's additional costs for transfer buses and for our uh, athletic buses and special ed buses. But in general, it's about $45,000 per route. Um. Are we, so as we look at back to school, and if in fact we have to space the kids appropriately in that would entail double routes, or, or if we could only fill the buses to half, um, that seems to be a big number cost-wise. Is there any way to, we've got to have that on our radar, I guess is the point I'm trying to make. Um, yeah, it's it has potential to be to be a significant cost. We do have uh, federal stimulus funding from the initial uh, CARES Act. It's called. Uh, we're anticipating uh, there is still some final calculations around uh, sharing some of our funds with private schools, but we're anticipating about two hundred thirty thousand dollars in CARES Act funds. We've talked about that at the board uh, table in the past. And one potential use, and, and that can be used for a wide variety of things related to uh, the pandemic, uh, whether it's student instruction, uh, protective equipment, uh, any costs uh, that come about, and, and additional transportation would be a potential cost. So there is, there is a possible fund for some of those trans, transportation costs that might come up, uh, but it's not a bottomless pit. Have they looked at the cost of realigning the athletic conference, how that's going to affect? I know football is first, but. 
Is yeah. that a big chunk or not? I'm not certain. That's something that we can check on. Um, another thing, question I have. The with go right has are we still considering using the here's the bus app or whatever it's called? Yeah. Like, would you look at that as a as a possible like something we can like terminate if needed? It's a potential savings down the road if we decide to move away from it right now. When we adopted that, that's a multi-year, I believe. Uh, Terry, correct me if I'm wrong. Is that a three or a four-year agreement that we have for the the Where's My Bus app? Um, I'm not certain on how many years that is, but it's more than we don't have the ability to end that right now. When we went into that agreement, Go Right Way incurred some upfront expenses, uh, and that's why it's a multi-year payoff for the district. It is a significant expense. So as we look at down the road, we want to make sure that it is something that we value uh, and that we're getting some bang for our buck out of that. One of the things that has made it less effective than we had hoped is uh, because we often have students hopping on different buses, going to grandma's today or going to a uh, different location on, on Tuesday than they are on Friday, it negates the usefulness of that app. That app is most valuable if we know who, that, who those students are who are on that specific bus uh, daily. Um, obviously, if we're making changes to our transportation system because of uh, spacing kids out for next year, that'll have an impact on how well that app will be used to. So we don't have the ability right now to say we're not gonna use it anymore. We're still paying it off. Uh, but once that's done, we'll bring that to the board as a decision on whether yeah. we want to renew that or not. I thought when we approved it was only a one-year deal. That's my what was my understanding when it was first brought to the board, but uh, I'll have to go back and review that because to me that yeah. would be a perfect trade-off. Yeah. Get rid of that and keep, you know, um, we can you know, address some of the folks' um, concerns yes. here. But uh, I'll look into that concern some more, but I'm pretty sure that it's a multi-year payoff on it. Okay. okay. Uh, I do have the answer if you'd like it, Rich. Oh, yeah. um, the uh, according to my research. The app was an addendum to our existing contract. So our contract goes until um, uh, like 2023. There's three, there, the three years that are remaining on the contract um, as an addendum to the contract uh, that the app would um, be included in the, in the contract for those three years, which is pretty much what Rich is saying. Thank you. All right, last item on the Transportation Committee, and Joe actually touched upon this a moment ago, uh, is what does transportation look like in the fall? A uh, high-level discussion on, again, social distancing, how many uh, students might be allowed on a bus at any given time, uh, and any regulatory guidance that we might receive or may receive from the state or Department of Health Services. Uh, again, no action was taken, high-level discussion, uh, primarily what was had. And so that is the Transportation Committee report. Are there any questions for Dave or the committee, which we met last week? Otherwise, good summary. Thank you, Dave. You're welcome. Uh, five is policy committee report. We also met last week, and that is chaired by Rick, and he can update us on their work. Okay, thank you, Joe. The policy committee met on June 3rd. We had quite a list of things to go over. We have, had not met since January. Um, in your board packet, you'll see the long list, uh, over two pages. A lot of them were minor changes from NEOLA, statutes or uh, verbiage type things. There were uh, a couple larger rewrites, re such as uh, technology, and there were a couple new ones. Um, uh, for example, a uh, new policy on uh, use of social media. Uh, all that info is in uh, board docs if you want to take a look at it. Um, any questions about these uh, first readings of the policy updates? Okay, then I will go on to item B, which is the second reading of some policy updates. And uh, this one does have a little twist to it. 
because the committee um, is bringing to the full board for approval a first, second reading, and possible adoption of policy 6116, the time and effort reporting. Um, Rich, could you or maybe another administrator speak to that a little bit? I have to unmute myself. I was doing so well. I remember to unmute myself. Uh, I don't know if, if Susan, do you want to speak to the time and effort uh, policy or if Susan's not uh, available, Carrie Bradley? I my gun. Okay, I think you can hear me. So time and effort reporting has to do with the federal money that we get. So we have some federal special education money, as well as we have title funds. And because it's federal money, there are special regulations that we have to give to show that we're using that money for the reason that it's given to us. So obviously the special ed money has to be used on students with disabilities and only students with disabilities. So if I have a teacher who's paid for out of federal flow through, I have to show that their job description aligns with their schedule and what they're doing. So it's just an extra um, oversight to prove that we are using the funds that we get, the grants that we get from the federal um, reserves. Yeah. Thank Questions you. <coughs> um, and the reason for this emergency uh, review of this is that it needs to be in place by the end of June. So that's kind of a little twist on this. Um, any comments or questions about the uh, item B? Then, Mr. President, I'll make a motion to approve and adopt the NEOLA policy updates as presented. Second. Thank you. Uh, I guess I'm unmuted. Uh, motion from Rick, seconded by Brian, to approve and adopt the policies that are presented on that list. Are there any questions? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 And opposed? Those policies are adopted. Thank you, Mr. Rick. And new business is item A, discussion and possible action on 2020-2021 school fees and meal prices. And this will be Mr. Mike Gosdick and Carrie Bradley updating that portion. I guess I will go first. Um, so just for those in the audience that don't have the memo in front of them, I'm just gonna read my memo that I sent to the board. Um, in 2010, Congress passed the Hungry Kids Act um, and basically this act requires that all schools participating in the national school lunch program provide the same level of financial support to paid students um, that, as to those that receive the free and reduced lunches. Uh, the paid lunch equity, lost my spot, there it is. Uh, the paid lunch equity regulation that the USDA uh, as out there for us to use helps to ensure that federal funds intended for those that qualify for free or reduced lunches are not aiding paid student meals. It also helps to ensure that we're not charging less for school meals than it costs us to produce each day. Uh, this year, much like last year, school districts with positive fund balance at the end of December 2019 were given an exemption from having to do the PL E tool, but I chose to do the PL E tool to find out where we were at as a district. Um, in using the tool, I discovered that we as a district should be charging $3.09 for each child's meal. Um, we're currently a little behind on that. So when you're behind on that, if you run short, you typically fall back on your fund balance. And we had a strong fund balance back in December and we no longer have a fund balance to fall back on. Um, additionally, the fund balance is there to assist when food costs go up and as we know, food costs have gone up in the last two months and also to assist us with purchasing new equipment or to replace old equipment such as ovens and steamers. So I am proposing to the board tonight that we increase school fees or school lunch prices, um, 10 cents for each of the grade levels. Um, and that would include as breakfast as well. Um, so 
Does anybody have any questions? Uh, we raised we raised lunch fees last year by ten cents as well. Just reiterating, by doing this, it allows us to fully utilize federal funds that are available, and, and, and that represent the primary driver for making this decision. Correct. Well, the, the primary driver is is to balance the budget, much like the school district. So, um, raising the rates helps me to budget my balance the budget accordingly. So, since if I can share something, since that topic came up, the the fund balance for our our school nutrition program has decreased this year because uh, over the last couple months we uh, provided meals free of charge to. A uh, large number of, of students 18 and under throughout our community. So um, Mike's budget took a little bit of a hit there, but it was a very worthwhile cause. Um, Mike, do you know approximately how many meals were served? Um, I don't have that off the top of my head, but it was in last week's Red Hawk. Yeah, I thought I was thinking 87,000 meals, if that sounds realistic. I, I would have to look that up. All right. All right. Okay, uh, it's an action item, folks. We need to approve that if we are so motivated. I'll make a motion to approve the 2020-21 school fees and meal prices as presented. I would second. Thank you. Motion from Mike, seconded by Dave, to approve the school meal prices, uh, the increase in school meal prices as presented. Are there any other questions? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 And opposed? The school fees are approved, or the meals are approved, I'm sorry, and I believe that takes There's us. There's no change in the school fees. I'm sorry? There's no change in the school fees. Okay. <coughs> Oops. So no change in fees means, do we have to act on that? I guess we don't. No, it's, it's one document that was attached there. Gotcha. All righty. And that'll take us up to 2020-21 school board calendar that Kim has included for us. Um, it's a couple subtle changes. Uh, we are going to have two regular meetings in July, uh, probably from this point forward, at least from what we think. Um, typically, there had been one um, based on a, on a historical uh, accommodation for some vacations for some folks and different things like that but given the amount of stuff that we have to continually update relative to back to school and some of that stuff we're going to have two meetings in july two in august and likewise for the uh, for the foreseeable future and we are going to make that second meeting in may a regular meeting just as if any other month, you know, so the second and fourth Monday will be regular meetings even out into May. Um, and the plan at this time, you'll see the asterisk there that go through August. Uh, we'll meet here, presumably through August, and I, I feel folks are gonna try and follow the kids. If we can get back into the school buildings with the kids in, uh, in September, uh, we will likely return to the LMC at the high school for our meeting site. Um, just a little bit more user friendly for uh, for our purposes and for folks that join us. So that is. is there, are there any questions? And then obviously she has on the side there some of the uh, the highlighted things that happen throughout the year. And our annual meeting is noted there, time and place. Um, just wanted to explain to you that location differential. Okay, if no questions, I'll jump down to miscellaneous. And A there is, as it always is, the action on the staffing report, which is included for you. 
I'll make a motion to approve the staff and reports as presented. Okay. Thank you. Motion to work seconded by Diamond to approve the staffing report that you see in front of you. Are there any questions? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And opposed. Thank you. The staffing report is approved. Uh, gifts and donations is letter B. That also is included for you, and that has $50,800 of a donation this month. Has a rather significant line item there that I'm extremely grateful for, as is all of our district. I'll make a motion to approve the gifts and donations with gratitude. Second. Thank you. Motion from Rick, seconded by Mike, to approve with our gratitude the gifts and donations to our district. Joe, before the vote, could I make sure a comment about the yeah. uh, donation, donations, if I could? Um, uh, some very significant donations here. We really appreciate the Milton Band parents for the, the instruments for the marching band. We hope to be able to see them out in action this summer, and we'll we'll see uh, how that goes. And the donation uh, from the McKenna Family Foundation for the elementary classroom libraries uh, fills a very strong need for us. Our classroom libraries have been neglected a little bit over the years in our elementary schools. And, and this donation is really going to allow us to get updated and additional uh, books for students to read in their classrooms. A big part of, of our reading program is students being able to choose uh, books that they're interested in right in their classroom. And, and uh, this is going to allow us to update our elementary classroom libraries. Uh, then we're going to start uh, budgeting annually to make sure that we don't fall as far behind in those updates as we have been. So uh, it's, it's going to be a huge benefit to our students across all of our elementary schools. Very good. Thank you, Rich. I was remiss in not uh, adding my uh, admit, recognition of that. Uh, all in favor of that motion signify by saying aye. Aye. And opposed. Joe, I'm just going to abstain just since it's my family's foundation. Duly noted, but thank you nonetheless. That, uh, that motion passes. Yeah, meeting dates. Um, let me just start with the caveat. Tomorrow's not an official board meeting, but um, certainly want to reiterate uh, the invitation to uh, anyone in the community or anyone listening or joining, et cetera, to uh, join us tomorrow night at 6.30 at the auditorium uh, at the high school. Uh, and uh, people that are going to that, I want to give an update. There is some construction work that's going on at the high school. The front parking lot will be open, so you'll be able to park in the front lot parking lot. You will be able to get in the main entrance, but there are some, uh, fen there's some fencing up, but the gate will be open and we'll have staff there to direct you how to get both into the school and uh, if you need the elevator or uh, how to get through the school into the, the Performing Arts Center. Uh, we also have a couple other upcoming meetings that have been scheduled. We have a Human Resources Committee meeting on June 17th. Uh, I think we still need to set a time uh, for that so we can talk through the time on the 17th for that HR committee meeting. We have our regular uh, next regular board meeting on June 22nd. That will be here at 6.30. And then we're looking to schedule both a finance committee and a policy committee meeting uh, sometime in the upcoming weeks. They're not uh, uh, time sensitive for this week, but if we could find a time next week uh, to get those in or uh, sometime very soon for both policy and finance. I know uh, Diamond on the Finance Committee and, and Rick on the Policy Committee, if you can kind of look at schedules and, and get some things going on that. And I don't know if we can decide right now what time on the 17th for the HR committee or if we want to just uh, communicate by email to get that out. Does 1015 work for Joe and Rick? It's a Wednesday, is that right? Yes. And what time did you suggest? Would 10.15 work? I'm going to say that I'm flexible, so you folks I wanna, are here. I do want to share that um, 
our admin team is working throughout the day that day. That's one of the days that we're working on some planning for, for the start of the school year. So we have that blocked off from 8 a.m. until 4 p.m. Uh, and that would involve Chris Tukendorf, myself, and Carrie Bradley, who typically are at the HR committee meetings. Um, we could look at a different day if that time works best. Uh, the rest of that week is a little bit more flexible for us. I could make four work. If four works, that would work out great for us. Would four work for both of you guys? Chris, you on pick the day. 17th on a day you have your entire calendar booked. I'm just yeah. throwing that out there, it's but we'll make day. 4 okay. p.m. work. If, if four works, that's good with me. So, yeah. HR at four on the 17th. That sounds very good. I think that's all that we had then for right now. Unless we do, we want to try to schedule those policy and and um, and finance. Yeah, when is ideal, Carrie, for finance? Like this Thursday or next Thursday? Okay. Which is the 17th too early for that policy meeting? The se if we did it on the 17th, we would have to do it after the HR committee, the four o'clock HR committee. Um, would we have policies ready by then? I, I think we, we should push it out a little bit, right? So the one I'm having for the next round of policies, that one isn't as, as important as the other one. Yeah, the finance, we sh we'd like to get that week. If the 18th or 19th works, we could look at the following week, uh, the week of the 22nd sometime for, for HR, I think would work out, or for, excuse me, for policy would work out fine. And I know we have some, some new board members on some of our committees. Finance is, is Diamond, Joe, and um, Dave. And Dave. Dave, let's see here. And Joe, trying to get my days up here. Um, the 18th, I have availability like after 11. 11, carry 11 on the Thursday, the 18th. Uh, that That's okay. For me. Yeah. Brian, can you do the 24th at 5.30? Right. Can you, can you do the 24th at 530? Yeah. Okay. Yes. 24th at 530 is what they're talking. If that sounds good, 24th at 530 for policies. Yeah, that sounds okay. wonderful. All right. We did that pretty well tonight. And then maybe uh, send us reminders of what we just agreed to. <laughs> Kim will send out meeting invites. Yep. For me especially, I think most of my colleagues are better at than I am. So. And we'll continue with those. I, I think this room works pretty well for the policy committee or for all of our committee meetings for right now too. Um, it, it gives us the opportunity to spread out in this room, so we'll just plan on using this space. Are we good on dates? Yeah. That is. Uh, Mr. Martin, over 14,000 meals um, served with our Mr. Gazda. I looked it up and I think it's important to know because they work very hard to get I apologize for my 87,000, which was wildly off. <laughs> it seemed that many to the folks that were putting together. <laughs> well, that. I could have sworn that I saw in the Red Hawk review. <laughs> there are a large, there are a large <laughs> number of people served. It's an impressive number, no matter what it is. So hats off to the to the folks from Mike and myself. That, that pulled that off. It was. It was. Uh, I went up and watched it a couple of days. It was amazing. Uh, I've exhausted my agenda. 
I need an I make a motion to adjourn. Thank you. Aye. 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 And we'll see you tomorrow night. Okay.